Well, in this video, you're going to see pretty much the entire interview I did with evangelist Ted Shelsworth Jr. All about worship leading tips for worship leaders, really. We're going to talk about everything from worship fails, three reasons worship teams actually fail, how to lead dynamic worship, pretty much worship leading one-on-one, should we allow unbelievers on the worship team? Well, you're going to see the answer to that question. And dealing with praise problems and a lot more. But yes, I'm very excited about this. Let me know in the comments what questions you have about worship leading. And maybe I can do another interview with Evangelist Ted Shelsworth Jr. online just because of the quarantine thing. And we can answer some of those questions. But yes, throw them down in the comments, like this video, and share it with your other worship leading friends if you have any. Hopefully, hopefully you do. Get out there, like, communitize with people. You know what I mean. Share this video with anybody you think it would benefit. Share it on Facebook. You never know what kind of friend you might have that could really benefit from it. But that's it. Let's get into the video. All right, so the first video in this series is probably my favorite, Worship Fails with Evangelist Ted Shuttlesworth Jr. So let's get into it, but first, let me know your favorite worship fail that you've done in the comments section below. Let me know in the comments, and maybe even we can talk about your comment later in a future video, but let's get into it. A lot of churches are incorporating teens into the praise and worship team, but a lot of teens are nervous about getting up because they're afraid of the mistakes that they will make. Yeah. What are some of your most embarrassing moments, and how did you get through them? I, I uh, My pastor was preaching one time, and he got really preaching, and of course we're Pentecostal. I jumped on the Hammond organ to play behind him. The organ was so old, we bought it used, and we would had it refurbished. I jumped and slid into that organ bench, and that organ bench collapsed like a house of cards. It just all fell. I fell out. I fell over, hit, bashed my head off the, the, the monitor on the uh -huh. platform. I'm laying there. I had wild socks on. The, the platform had a knee wall that was about two feet tall. My feet are up in the air with my pants down in those wild socks. He's preaching, and everyone's laughing. He turns around and just sees legs and socks. That's I mean, awesome. The, the thing just completely destroyed. One time, I was in Bible school. We were having a Holy Ghost meeting at Ramah. And uh, the dude that was playing the electric guitar, he felt the Holy Ghost, man, and he threw that guitar on the ground and took off running around the church. And as he's running, they had set the chair sections a little too close to the wall. It was about that much room between the wall and the end chair. Well, he had these old leather wingtip dress shoes on that the bottoms were like so slick and warm. Wow. So he's running full blast in the Holy Ghost and tries to make the turn and there's no traction. He just starts sliding. And to us, all it looked like was he just took off running as hard as he can into the wall <laughs> yeah. and then knocked himself out and oh, fell man. on the ground. He's gone. Be like, man, he fell out in the Holy Ghost. No, he knocked himself out. Yeah. And uh, I've had all kinds of stuff. I've start, I, I don't know if you've ever had this happen where you finish a song in one key and you change keys to go to the next song, but your inner ear still hears the previous key. Yes. And I've done that where I've changed and then I play the whole intro and come in and start singing in the previous <laughs> yeah. key while playing in the new key. Yeah. Oh, that's, man. Probably the most embarrassing thing that's ever happened to me, maybe, maybe not most embarrassing, but it was pretty like, dang, is uh, I was playing behind a very well-known minister that's been all over international television, all this. He had come to our church to minister, and he wanted to sing a worship song, and he himself is a singer. He said, come, come to the keyboard, let's do the song. And so he's ministering to people. He said, play this song. Well, I start playing it on the keyboard. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm just laying it down. He's, he ministers to like three, four people and turns around and goes, stop playing. Sound man, put on my Terry McCalman CD. <laughs> like, <I was laughs> no. Like, Thank you. Thank you very much. So lots of stuff happens, all right? Lots of Don't stuff. Don't be afraid of making oh, mistakes. Oh, man, I've been rebuked. I've, I, I've yeah. had so many things happen. I mean, it's just, it's insane. Yeah. You have to just push through the mistakes. You're going to make mistakes mm -hmm. at some point. Just keep, don't, number one, don't make a big deal about it. Don't put the face on it. You're like, you're like, I can't believe what you're just, just play through it yeah. and keep playing. You know, if you sing a, a sour note, you hit the wrong chord. Let me tell you, the average person that's in the auditorium doesn't know music and won't even be able to tell yeah. that you mm -hmm. did anything wrong. You know, most people after that, I was like, man, I really botched that song. People are like, really? I didn't, I didn't hear that. Yeah. It's like, yeah. A lot of the times with, with me, whenever I was first starting out in leading worship and I made, some mistakes or something, and someone would come up to me and say, man, you did great. I'd say, yeah, but except that one part, they would have never known that never. I made a mistake there nope, you if I didn't it. say anything. Yeah, yeah. Totally. so don't, don't acknowledge it. Don't be nervous about the mistakes. Continue to work to get better and become excellent. 
but then just be faithful with where you are now. You know, don't wait until I, well, until I get to this level. I'm not even going to volunteer on the worship. No, give God what you have where you are now mm. and let him increase it and anoint you as you're worshiping. Yeah. As churches, should we allow unbelievers on the praise and worship team? No. Yep. <laughs> Thanks for watching, folks. All right, up next, three reasons that worship leaders actually fail. One of my favorite ones is stop singing unscriptural songs. So let's get into it. What are some of the biggest hindrances you see that to praise and worship teams while you're traveling? Because he travels all around the world, all around the country, sees thousands of praise and worship teams. So what are the biggest hindrances you see that keep praise and worship teams from going up another level? Um, in fighting amongst the group, mm. where they're holding grudges or mad at each other for one reason or another, feuding, that, that's mm. horrible. Yeah. You know, I wanted that solo, and she got the solo, and I can't believe it. Her voice ain't mm. as good as mine. It brings division. Yeah. Pride, which is really what causes most of that. Wow. And pride yeah. goes before destruction, haughty spirit before a fall. Pride was the devil's uh, issue. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, you hear so many people say, you know, and he was the praise and worship leader of heaven, which is actually derives from apocryphal books of the Bible. We don't actually have anything in the Bible that says that, but we do know that pride was his issue yeah. and pride goes before destruction. Anytime you have pride, anywhere pride enters, it begins to kill. Mm. It kills relationships. It kills everything. And it causes you to walk into destruction. You have to remember this forever. And, and it's the best. I, I've, I've worked with guys that are phenomenal players, but they're so full of themselves, I'll never ask them back again, ever. Mm -hmm. I've got a team now of guys around me that are so humble and meek. And remember this, meekness is the key to inheritance. Mm -hmm. Meekness. Matthew 5, 5, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. If you look at two different passages about Moses... The Bible says, I believe it's Exodus 12, 3, the Bible says that he was the wealthiest man in all the land, but Numbers 11, 3 says he was the meekest man in all the earth. The meekest man became the greatest man. Mm -hmm. Why? Meekness is the key to inheritance. God resists the proud actively yeah. and gives more favor to the humble. So stay humble on your worship team. No fighting, no bickering. Here's another thing. Stop singing songs that are unscriptural. It is one of the most massive, massive hindrances to the anointing moving in the church. God's not going to anoint something that contradicts his word. Right. You know, it's just, it needs to be said. Yeah. Don't sing unscriptural worship songs. Mm -hmm. Don't say unscriptural things. And God will anoint his word. Yeah. That's so good. All right. Up next is one of my favorites, probably. It's how to lead dynamic worship in his book, Unhang Your Harp, which, by the way, is linked up in the description below. He talks about being a dynamic worship leader and the importance of of it. This is a very powerful video that a lot of people have been enjoying. Let's see, Gwen Jones says here on the video, good stuff, discipleship never ends. That's right, you got it exactly right. Discipleship never ends. So let's get into this leading dynamic worship video. In your new book, Unhang Your Harp, you talked about being a dynamic worshiper. Mm -hmm. Can you talk to us a little bit about what it means to be a dynamic worshiper and how did you get there? Yeah, I think being a dynamic worshiper has more to do about being led by the Spirit and not just stick into a list or stick into a chart, being willing to flow with the Spirit of God when He wants to move, not cutting the song off because we did two courses and three verses, uh, that we've got to be open. You know, it's, I've been in services before where, you know, the, if the anointing is on a, a flow or a song, we may sing that song for 30 minutes. Mm -hmm. We may just stay in the move of the Holy Spirit. And um, if you get too uh, robotic with your what you're doing, it's not a ministry. You know, you have to be able to uh, minister to the people um, and you know, the psalmist said that. He said, oh, magnify the Lord with me. He's leading them. Magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. We're not cheerleaders up there. We're actually engaging God's people and bringing them into God's presence through praise and worship. So I give you um, in the book five ways to increase and develop your gift mm -hmm. to become a dynamic worshiper, habits, if you will. Yeah. Um, my question dealing with that actually is, Whenever you are flowing in the Spirit, for those watching, there are probably beginner worship leaders mm -hmm. um, and musicians. They might not be ready to get in that flow yet. Sure. What would you recommend to them to start working on to get to that spot? I would say it's so very important for praise and worship leaders along with ministers. I mean, you are a minister if you're leading praise and worship uh, to spend time praying. You need to be a person of prayer, uh, and you need to pray in the Holy Spirit in your, in your heavenly language. That's so vital to being connected to the heart of God. 
uh, times of fasting throughout your year. You know, you should be dedicating yourself to the presence of God. I heard a praise and worship leader say this one time. I thought it was phenomenal. He said that he, uh, before any great doors opened for him or he was on TV or doing things at conferences, he drug his upright piano into his kitchen where there was the best acoustics and would sit there and play for hours and weep tears and cry singing only to God, an audience of one, and just gave his devotion and his time to the Lord. And because he was able to do that, when he got in front of a crowd of 1,000, 2,000, 30,000 people at one point every week, he was able to lead them because he had been in the presence of yeah. God before. And because he'd been there, he's not a tourist, he's a tour guide. He's not a tourist in God's presence. It's like, man, I don't know what we're doing either. We should, well, let's just see if we can go look. No, he's been there many times. Yeah. And because he's been there many times, he can lead others there and know where we're going. Yeah, and that um, brings up the point, you can't lead others where you haven't been. That's right, I put that so, in the book. Yeah, exactly. If, so again, link in the description, go check out Unhang Your Heart for a lot of important stuff that I think every praise and worship leader needs to take a look at because developing your personal life is vitally important because mm -hmm. you're, you're a leader. What starts at the head drizzles down to the body. Amen. And that could be good and that could be bad. So developing your spiritual gift of praying in tongues and developing it at home while no one is watching, that will enable you to really help lead no others question. in the congregation. Not a question at all. And I'll tell you, um, one of the things I hear said a lot in Pentecostal churches is, uh, you know, I'll tell you, brother, it doesn't matter if we hit every right note or sing every right note or every, but as long as the heart is right, it's what God wants our heart. That's not true. Mm -hmm. You know, the Bible says we were commanded by the psalmist, play skillfully on the harp. God is worthy of your excellence. You know, you should desire to give your very best to the Lord. When it was even Saul that was needing uh, relief from an, a spirit that was troubling his mind, he said, bring me someone that can play skillfully on the harp. Mm. And they said, we already know somebody like that. His name's David. His reputation preceded him yeah. because he developed his gift and became excellent in a crowd of sheep by himself, learning to play and write psalms and hymns and spiritual mm. songs. And so you should never stop. Remember this principle because it's extremely important. God looks at maintenance mode in anyone's life and calls it wicked. Matthew 25 is the parable that discover, we discover that the, the master gave talents to three servants. He gave one five, one two, one one. When he came back, the five had turned it into ten, the two had turned it into four, and the one buried it in the ground yeah. and said, here's your talent back. I know you're a hard man that reaps where you don't sow. He said, you wicked mm -hmm. servant. Yeah. He looked at that maintenance mode and said, it's wicked. If I give you a talent... If I give you a gift, if I give you a calling, you've got to work to increase it and develop it and don't just put it into cruise control and just coast through life. That's wicked. God wants you to increase what he's put on your life. Definitely. So what's very important is, when you're, especially when you're first starting out musically, develop your gift at home. No question. So when you get to church, mm -hmm. you are prepared. Now, I think this, is, this has been difficult for me in the past. I've gotten to the point where I understand it now. Whenever you are developing your gift on piano, guitar, drums, whatever your instrument might be vocally, whenever you are praising and worshiping God and leading others in that, sometimes it's hard to get away from thinking too much about what you're doing mm -hmm. and go over to praise and worship. Yep. So how, how would you recommend other people get from the spot of thinking too hard about their instrument Mm -hmm. and going into worship, or should they be thinking about their instrument? Uh, no, they should not be thinking about their instrument because what ends up happening is the reason, and this is just from my own personal experience of 21 years of doing it, um, there's so many that are part of worship teams that don't give any thought to what they're going to do until Sunday morning or late Saturday night. There's no preparation. Mm -hmm. There's And the reason they have to think about their instrument and they have to so hard focus on it is because they've not been giving that to God throughout the week. It should be, those things should become second nature to you yeah. so that you don't have to think about them. Practice makes better. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, if I'm sitting like last night, just up at the keyboard, I don't have to think, oh, how do I hit a D flat? How do I hit a flat seven chord? How do I, I don't have to do any of that. Mm -hmm. I literally can just flow because I've, I've worked to master that gift. Yeah. And then I can be led by God. And I'm not thinking about, oh, my, which chord am I going to next? I just play because it's second nature. And then the Lord can lead me. In this next one, called Should Unbelievers Be Allowed on the Worship Team, he gives the exact answer to that. Now, Giovanna says, come on now, so good, Ted, 100% on them money. 
Teddy always cracks me up at the end. Yeah, so you gotta, you gotta keep watching to the end. But let's see here. The Broski says, great video, guys. And Ruth says, absolutely not. I agree with you. In fact, let me know in the comments what you think. Should unbelievers be allowed on the worship team? Let me know in the comments, but let's jump into that video. As churches, should we allow unbelievers on the praise and worship team? No. Yep. <laughs> Thanks for watching, folks. <laughs> Never. My answer is no, you definitely should not do it. You, you're not qualified to praise a God you don't serve. Um, and, and if people would say, well, that's judgmental, you shouldn't judge people. First of all, there are prerequisites in the Bible for even ministering, for even being an elder in a church or a deacon. Mm. So, you know, God, it's not like God, it's like a free for all. People can come in and do whatever they want. God has a way. He has yeah. a system. You have to follow his system. It's his house. It's his thing. And so for me, to, for me to put somebody up there that doesn't even serve Christ, they're operating in a spirit of anti-Christ. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, that's, that should be enough for anybody that's watching. However, it's not. You say, well, that's very judgmental. Paul taught that we should judge within the church. It's okay to judge. He wrote to the Corinthians and said, you got a dude who's sleeping with his stepmother in the church and bragging about his sexual activity. Mm -hmm. Throw him out of the church. So, and turn him over to Satan for the destruction of his soul because he will not listen to correction. Mm. Well, Paul need to have a revelation of grace. You think Paul didn't have a revelation of grace? <laughs> Literally, you think he was not walking in love? He was walking in love by separating the man so that a little leaven didn't spoil the whole lump. You understand? Yeah. Because sin is contagious. It'll jump on people. It's a spirit of unrighteousness. Mm -hmm. And uh, we still love people, but sit them down. Doesn't mean you kick them out of the church, but have them sit mm -hmm. until they're willing to serve the Lord. And, um, you know, if you're going to work for God, it's probably good that you serve him. Yeah. You that know? goes back to what we said earlier. What starts at the head drizzles down to the body. No question. Whether good or bad. And let bad. me tell you, I have watched on praise and worship teams as people who don't live for the Lord get involved. And then there's sexual issues that go mm -hmm. through the team. There's, I mean, all kinds of people going out doing drugs afterwards, don't even stay in the church for the pastor's mm -hmm. sermon. I've seen guys leave, get up and leave, go to restaurants and eat lunch and come back to play the end. No. I mean, I'm, I'm telling you, it's it, it just, it's prevalent. I had a pastor tell me he had to dismiss his whole worship team because they were coming in on Saturday late evening and breaking down all the sound equipment and all the instruments, going playing bars all through the area, making some money. They'd come back early, early Sunday morning, set it all back up and do praise and worship. No. He said, when I, he said I didn't even know what was happening. When I found out, I let them all go. Well, of course, of course. Don't be a knucklehead. Mm -hmm. You know, serve the Lord and then work for the Lord. Yeah. Don't be a knucklehead. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. Hashtag knucklehead. Yeah. <laughs> you sit there and look angry if you want. I'll preach it. I preached it coming in. I'll preach it going out. Yeah. All right. Praise problems. What are some problems that you run into? Let me know in the comments real fast. Take a minute and please consider subscribing to this channel for future praise and worship team tips and tools for teens. I try to release one video every single Tuesday and a live stream every single Saturday around four o'clock-ish around that time. So you can join me live if you'd like to. But coming up next is praise problems and exhortation tips, how to lead worship and flow in it. That's what he's going to be talking about in this final video. So keep watching for that good, good stuff, good stuff. So leading a team is difficult a lot of the time because you might have people that don't take it as seriously as you. Sure. And then won't show up to practice being practiced or prepared. So how would you keep a praise and worship team together and keep accountability? There's wonderful tools available now. Um, I thank God for technology every day. Uh, but you know, you go to websites like multitracks.com and you'll, you'll have things now where we can actually send our musicians uh, the tracks that we're going to be doing. And there's a thing that now called custom mix where you can raise their part above everyone else's part so they can clearly hear what they're supposed to be playing. They can then easily and effectively practice those things at home, wow. knowing exactly what they should be ready to do on Sunday morning. Um, and you can do it for your singers too, with a soprano, tenor, alto parts, musicians. And those are tools that I think really help us that even when we're at home, mm -hmm we can be effectively practicing and preparing for what we're gonna do for the Lord on Sunday yeah. or Wednesday. That's really cool. Mm -hmm. And again, I'll link this stuff up in the description below so that way you can take a look at it yourself. So sometimes it's hard as a praise and worship leader to look out at a congregation and they're all staring at you, mm -hmm. not doing what you're ready to do. So how can, sure. you, help, how can you help other praise and worship leaders um, give them advice to bring the congregation up another level? The reason that many praise and worship leaders can't do that is because they don't carry the proper amount of authority and, and boldness to actually lead a congregation um, in praise and worship. And so they're unsure of themselves, they're insecure, all that stuff. That's not how you're supposed to be. 
part of the praying in the Holy Ghost that I advised you about earlier, when you pray in the Holy Ghost, you are building up your most holy faith, the Bible says. You're preparing it for action. It doesn't give you more faith. It takes the faith that you have and get, it's like stretching out before a race. You're warming up your muscles. When you pray in the Holy Ghost, you're warming up your faith for action. Uh, people don't pray enough. Uh, and not, number two, you, one of the things they need to pray for is boldness. Paul asked for, for that from the church of Ephesus. He said, pray that boldness would be granted unto me. Well, listen, he was probably the boldest man in the New Testament other than Christ. And if he needed to pray for it, we need to pray for it boldness. So you're building your level of authority in the anointing and you're building that level of boldness. I see so many people looking out over the crowd. They can't even look people in the eye. They have to like look over the crowd, look people in the face, look them in the eye and tell them, lift your hands with me. You know, one of the things that ticks me off in this generation more than anything else is this stupid suggestion stuff that people do. If you're comfortable with it, lift your hands with me. It's like, whether you're comfortable or not, lift your hands because yeah. the Bible says, lift up holy hands mm -hmm. without wrath. It's like, what, what, what are we getting into where it's like now, if you decide to enter in, you know, if you're comfortable with saying, thank you, Jesus, clap your hands mm -hmm. because the Bible says, clap your hands, all you people yeah. lift your hands because it says lifting, holy hands unto God without wrath or doubting, you know, sing because it commands us to sing a new song unto the Lord, a song of praise unto our God. So, you know, we, we're doing these things because the Bible commands them not because of someone on stage is suggesting that you do it. We as believers are following specific commands yeah. to praise the Lord. This is not a suggestion. So when I understand my position, I am a messenger of God to deliver to you an encouragement or an exhortation to join me. In, that's what the psalmist, the psalmist didn't say, if you're comfortable with it, <laughs> magnify the Lord with me. He said, magnify the Lord with me. Yeah. Let us exalt his name together. There's got to be a boldness and authority. Definitely. I hold this position because God's anointed me to stand here and I'm, a, I'm responsible to bring God's people into his presence. Mm -hmm. You know, you can look at it. If you're looking over the crowd and 70% of the audience is scrolling their Twitter feed or their Instagram feed, you probably haven't built the proper amount of authority and anointing yet to lead a congregation. You've got to be bold and look people in the eye, you know, smile when you're on the stage, encourage people. Now's the time to get into his presence yeah. and study the word enough that you have something of substance to say That's in an exhortation. One of my hugest pet peeves for praise and worship leaders is that their transitionary exhortation is the first words of the next song. Yeah. It's like the biggest cop out ever. You know, it's like, you know what I mean? Yeah. How many know his love is reckless? Amen. I mean, let's, <laughs> let's play that song. It's like, <laughs> yeah. it, you know, it's not, that's not an exhortation. How about this? Get a verse, one verse from the Bible, find one verse of scripture and build an exhortation around it. You know, the Bible says, you know, you, you can use two scriptures. Let me give you a quick example. Psalm 22, three, God inhabits the praises of, of Israel. We are spiritual Israel. Uh, number two, Psalm 16, 11, in his presence is fullness of joy. Your, your exhortation can be between songs. How many know that when we praise the Lord, his presence is activated. And when his presence is activated, yeah. fullness of joy. You're leaving here today full of the joy of the Lord, which is your strength. Verse number three, Nehemiah 8, 10. It is your strength. Today, as you praise him, new strength is coming upon your body and into your mind. Let's lift our hands as we sing this next song. Yeah. That's just a quick exhortation based on the word that will build the faith of the people because yeah. the hearing of the word builds faith, but it's also something that's going to build expectancy mm -hmm. for, for what we're about to do in this next song. So be ready, be prepared to minister yeah. you know, to people. Don't yeah. let those transitions be awkward. Plan mm -hmm. them out, plan the yeah, transitions. Yeah, because the atmosphere of expectancy is the breeding ground of miracles. That's it. So don't be afraid to give them something to praise about. Don't be afraid to tell them to do something. No like raise question. your hands, clap your hands, jump, run. Mm -hmm. You know, don't be afraid to do that um, because praise is uncomfortable at its core. So you take sacrifice that. Sacrifice of praise. Yeah, the sacrifice of praise. It's a sacrifice. Worship and praise, there are differences, and we're going to talk about that later on the channel. So again, subscribe. But praise is uncomfortable. So don't be surprised if on a Sunday morning you've got a crowd of people that are still half awake scrolling through Facebook. Right. You've got to wake them up. Yeah. Where do you think praise and worship music is going in the future? Where do you foresee it? I pray that it goes back to a focus on Christ and the redemptive work of Christ. Um, I'm sure that if you look at Bible prophecy, the Bible says there'll be the hearts of many will grow cold, many will fall away from the faith. Um, so we know by Bible prophecy that 
uh, it's not going to be the majority. You know, the, the, the path to heaven is straight and narrow. Few there be that find it. Uh, the majority are not going to be dedicated heavily to Christ. We even know that's true with preaching. There will be people who have itching ears that will accumulate under themselves teachers that will teach what they want to hear rather yeah. than what they should hear. The same will happen with worship. There will be people that want to sing things that make them feel good but that don't challenge them and that, that aren't lining up with God's Word. We're already starting to see that. Yeah. Uh, but I know that God always has a remnant on the yes. earth, and I'm going to be a part of the remnant. You will be. Mm -hmm. And uh, for those that are a remnant for God, we will be singing what the Bible says We'll be singing about Christ and his redemptive work, uh, about his soon coming until he comes. And we will always be pressing in for the anointing to change people as yeah. we praise and worship. And so, you know, I don't want to sound like, you know, one of those doom and gloom type of guys, but you have to look at Bible prophecy yep. and understand that people's dedication will begin to fall away as we get closer to the coming of Jesus. So it's what we're seeing now. You turn on Caleb and it's like half the stuff's unlistenable. Yeah. It's unlistenable. You know, bands that are singing songs about like, I'm a sinner with filthy hands. Like the Bible doesn't teach that. Yeah. But that's what you get. We can't compromise. You know, the message. It's getting easier and easier to compromise a message. Mm -hmm. But as the remnant, we need to make sure that we stick to the word and we uh, stick to our guns to make sure we don't give up or compromise. There's a lot of these praise and worship leaders out there that don't even use the King James Bible anymore. <laughs> My God, Jesus is on the 1611. <laughs> I know you get your panties in a bunch, but let me tell you, if you're going to be a real man, you got to have a leather lung gravy sopping biscuit eating. <laughs> <laughs> Holy Ghost and Fire Devil casting out King James Bible preaching. Pre I'm about to run in this place. Elvis or the Beatles? Uh, Elvis. Elvis? Cool. He's my friend. Yeah. That was the lightning round, by the way. Elvis or the I'm Beatles? I'm starting the lightning round, just so y'all know. Oh, is there a lightning round for Yeah, him? that was it. Uh, just one? Just one. Okay. You, you answered all the other questions. Yeah. Elvis. Elvis. Yeah, I have to say Elvis over the Beatles. Elvis was annoying that the Beatles weren't. Yep. How great thou art. <laughs> there you go. That's exactly right. That's the best analogy I've ever heard. I don't even say Beatles passion.